You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. I didn't do any missions. Half the time, I just ran around slaying orcs. This week on Backward Compatible, with the arrival of a new year, Richard, Jim, and Chris look back at 2014. What trends dominated the gaming market? Which titles were worthwhile? And what changes can we look forward to in 2015 and beyond? The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Backward Compatible. Hey there, Backward Compatible listeners. This is Richard, back from a very, very long hiatus to welcome you to podcast number 20. We're on a pretty good pace here. I think Chris said earlier we're on about a 40 a year pace. Yeah, yeah. it's good considering we started in the middle of last year. Um, we're about 20 here at the beginning of the new year, so I guess... Not too bad for a couple of bummy students. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm back. I'm Richard. This is Chris and Jim, of course. Hello, I'm Chris. And I'm Jim. Uh, Jim is vacant. <laughs> no, um, we are here to bring you our sort of our thoughts on 2014, a year in review, and the pros and cons and how they sort of affect our interpretation of what 2015 has to offer. You know, a typical New Year topic. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, near the end of 2014, I kind of took a hiatus from gaming. Hmm. Uh, I didn't play many of the big blockbusters that came out in the last couple of months. I stuck mostly to my Hearthstone and my MMOs. Hmm. You know, how about you guys? I- interestingly, I was kind of in the same boat. Um, The first half of the year, I actually didn't do very much gaming at all, just in general. And then when we started the site back up, I kind of had an excuse to do more gaming. And then once I got kind of my... uh my little bit of a fix, then you know the the addiction reawoken. <laughs> I'm not really that addicted, um, but yeah, I, I sort of kept up for a little while, and then found that um, like over the break when I could have been playing a lot of new stuff, I actually just like went back and started playing old stuff that I needed to catch up on. So yeah, how about you, so, Jim? Did you keep so up with so, games or? Um, I mean, I followed releases, but my question kind of is because what I did mostly was I went back and I played games that I hadn't played before. Uh, like, for example, I didn't play uh, South Park Stick of Truth until a couple weeks ago. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> which I, I, I really did enjoy but I ha- as a South Park fan, but I haven't played it before. So my question is, what are these big releases that were that came out in the last two months? Because well, I don't Dragon even know. Age. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Dragon oh, Age Dra- is well, the yeah, big one. I, I actually I put off Dragon Age because um, I... Didn't really, don't really have the funds to get it right away, and I wasn't like super stoked to pick it up, to be perfectly honest with you. But uh, other than yeah. that game, what is there another one that? Well, there's I, the I big. Think of, there's the big FPS titles. There's Call of Duty: mm-hmm. Advanced Warfare, and I picked that 4, one. Yeah. Uh, uh, Far Cry Four. Uh, I never played Destiny. That's because I don't have a PS4 uh, personally. Yeah. But I mean, I also have no interest. I'll, I'll, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. None of those sound interesting to me. Um, when, when they come out with a sequel to uh, Blood Dragon, then I'll go yeah, ahead and I'll there you that go. Up. There Far you Cry go. Four, the Far Cry Four mm-hmm. Diamond Dragon, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I've heard a lot yeah. of good things about Far Cry Four. Mm-hmm. The typical good things, though, yeah. like you know, they've got a gorgeous world mm-hmm. and it's fun mechanics, but the world is so vast. It's kind of like the Skyrim mm-hmm. symptom. It's like it's so big. And so open that the narrative content they develop for it is just so sparing that you just kind of get bored. And even if they create it a lot, like, it's just that everything is so spread out that it doesn't feel like it's a lot, you know? Right. You know, honestly, now now that I say that out loud, I think one of my biggest problems with 2014 was that we didn't really have a Skyrim equivalent in the sense of, like, we didn't really have many adventure games, you know, non-Telltale narrative adventure games. Uh We didn't really have many games that focused much on world building. The Dragon Age, I haven't played that one yet, Mm -hmm. but from what I understand, it did have that a little bit, right? I know that my old roommate said that he spent, like, 30 hours in the first area of the Mm -hmm. game, so... Yeah, it's, um... Dragon Age Inquisition um, does take on a bit of a Skyrim feel. It's not truly open world, but what you have is these like very large zones that feel like they're more or less open world. Um, and like we talked about a couple episodes ago when uh, Trey was on with us, um, we had uh, 
we, we kind of had the thought that it was nice because because it was open world, but it was a small enough open world that still felt like a designed level, if that okay. makes sense. Um, now, for me, like you know, I can sort of see how that appeals to like the explorer player type, the completionist player type, that sort of thing. Um, I know a lot of friends who really dig that aspect of the game. For me, um, and you know, Jim uh, likes to sort of poke fun at this a little bit. Um, there's kind of like this ten hour stretch. Um, where it feels like it's basically the prologue of the game, and then the real game picks up. Oh, interesting. Will. Ten um, hours. Mm-hmm. It's a long uh, time. Think, was it ten, or was it even more than that? And some of that was, I'm sure, think, idle time. But hmm. Yeah, I think I think the, the statement was 15 hours, and I remember, point, uh, I, again, I haven't played the game, but I remember saying that if a game is taking that long to grab mm-hmm. me, um, I have no interest in right, it. Right, yeah, that's, I mean, that I, was I expect, my first thought. I expect mm-hmm. to be grabbed really early in the game, and, you know, I understand in an RPG it might take you, like, maybe an hour, maybe two hours, but 15 mm. hours, 10, 15 yeah. hours, that's absurd. And, again, that's, that's for me, though, the narrativist. Like, well, but, there, you know, there's some people who jump right in and love it. Sure, but, you know, that's honestly, like, um, in television recently, I've had a lot of, in the age of Netflix, mm. I've had people recommend me these television shows that previously I had never heard of. Mm. And it's because, oh, they get good after the first season. Yeah, I've heard, I know? hear that a lot, which is funny. Yeah. You know, and so, but if it takes me an entire season to get through to the good stuff, mm. or you want me to skip the first season, yeah, you know, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's the same thing with a game. If it takes you hours and hours to actually get into the meat of the narrative and the gameplay, mm-hmm. then I'm not interested. Right. You know, and there are lots of examples of games that have these lengthy and very like narrative heavy, um, you know, narratives stories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I recently I replayed Final Fantasy Tactics: War of the Lions, uh-huh. and you know that game. Yeah. From the Great very game. beginning, when you boot, I'm talking about the title screen, mm. it grabs you in the narrative, you know, and it's all just backstory. It's all you know, abstract premise of the narrative. But seriously, when you boot up your console, mm-hmm. it has you, you know. And it's, I, I think it's with uh, with games. It's not necessarily like they necess- they ha- they have to grab you with the narrative because some games are not. Of um, course, no. narrative games, but they have to grab you with the gameplay. One of the games that we played and reviewed pretty well, I think, talked about in uh, pretty joyous, good tones uh, was uh, Strider. Yeah, I was just thinking that, yeah, um, yeah, and I think you know, just from a gameplay perspective, um, I was into that game pretty much right from the start. Yeah, for sure. And that's kind of what you have to have, regardless of how they're doing it. Um, you know, whether it's by gameplay or whether it's by the story or whether it's by just kind of the atmosphere sort of drawing you in like the, the the sounds and the visuals and the production might draw you into that world as well but it has to have something to grab onto it you, you can't be waiting 10 hours for the game to start you know honestly um thinking about like the games catalog of 2014 it feels like one of the recurring themes or elements of these games is that they're very um I suppose you could say refined in the sense that they are new, modern versions of things that we've already seen. Mm -hmm. So, for example, across multiple genres, Mm -hmm. you have the new Telltale games that they just started... Now they're pumping them out. Like, they've got three new series going at the same time. I have played the first one of Game of Thrones, but I haven't played Tales from the Borderlands. I've played played both, yeah. But then uh, you had Hearthstone Mm -hmm. officially released at the beginning of the year. It came out of beta. Mm Mm-hmm which is just this very sleek, minimalist online card game client. Yeah. You have the new Call of Duty, Battlefield, and then Destiny, mm-hmm. which Destiny is, you know, while of course they had their own inspirations, it's pretty much just an MMO version of Borderlands yeah. that has been refined from all of the industry critique that has come from games of its ilk. Mm-hmm. You know, new Call of Duty, new Battlefield, new Assassin's Creed. Yeah, yeah. And so, well, there's nothing wrong with these games individually mm-hmm. at a first glance. I haven't played a lot of them, I sure, don't know. Sure. But not reviewing the games as a trend, it feels kind of boring. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing, that, it, that they come across as um, the concepts and everything just kind of seem bland. It doesn't seem like they're really... Um, wanting to do anything new or sort of stretch the envelope and sort of branch out. Well, you have to keep in mind... Uh-uh. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, you have to keep in mind, too, though, that the, no, the, the recent games, like the AAA games that have kind of been... Um, people have been super excited about because they're going to be, like, you know, new and revolutionary and all this different stuff. Watch Dogs, for instance. Everyone was super excited about that game. Probably spent a lot of money on it, got delayed, spent a lot of time on it, obviously. And then it comes out, and it's 
whatever. You know? Right, but you know, that's. But, I think that's honestly a symptom of the gaming climate. You know, mm-hmm. like Watch Dogs, its original premise that that was what people got hyped up for, mm-hmm. and the reason that people dogged on it. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> play um, was because they cut features. Yeah, they made it more streamlined. They, they, they made, it, made, it, made it more GTA. Right, they, what they got they, us excited. Right, yeah. they made it like an alternative GTA. Yeah, and you know the that's another case in which the gameplay um, was initially really eye catching mm-hmm. because it was you know a new way to interact with a GTA style environment, but the narrative and the gameplay were almost constantly at odds Mm -hmm. and the player didn't have any real way to interface with the narrative Mm -hmm. and that's also just the contextual narrative too and the environmental narrative you pretty much just had a quick time event even if it wasn't presented to you as such if you wanted to succeed you pretty much moused over the correct thing and hit the button you know so I think if Watch Dogs had continued with its original premise and its new innovations, Mm -hmm. then we could have had a break from that mold. But, you know, as it stands, I don't think we did. And same thing with Destiny. You know, people have been, even still, people are pretty hyped about Destiny. Apparently, it's a a huge financial success. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't see I hope so for what they spent. Well, right. (laughs) But I don't see what's different about it. You know, Mm -hmm. I yeah, I see a generic first-person shooter. They did the whole companion thing just like we've always had Cortana and we've always had people talking in your ear except this time it's the Dinklebot you know <laughs> and so I just don't get it I really don't yeah I um what I keep hearing from people too we might have talked about this briefly before is how the impression seems to be that people are generally like disappointed it's not as good as they were hoping it doesn't blow you away but because it's Bungie and they know what the hell they're doing with shooting mechanics they're able to make it fun enough on a moment to moment basis to keep you okay kind of and hooked. see I think junk that's, food almost I think you know? that's a perfect you know um, example of what we were just talking yeah. about which is like Bungie knows what the hell what they're doing. Yeah. You know, Activision and the people behind Call of Duty know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blizzard obviously knows what they're doing behind mm-hmm. Hearthstone. And so all of these games that have become so critically popular, they're just the best versions of stuff that existed before. Yeah, yeah. And so now that this year, I kind of qu- qualify this year as being the year of Twitch and mm-hmm. the year of social gaming. And so you have a lot more people watching stuff. You have the Dota International 4 with the biggest you know prize money on history mm-hmm. or in history. And you have all of these different spectator events, mm-hmm. social links, online games. And so I think... The focus was less on innovating mechanics, innovating narratives, and really just creating the best version of something we had previously to get more people in it. Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing too that that we that has been going on in this year is, of course, um, continuing to try to push the next generation. So they're all trying next generation of consoles. Yeah. So they're all trying to. Um, sort of show what they can do from a processing standpoint, which is what a lot of those big game releases, particularly the FPSs and Far Cry 4, have been focusing on, is trying to push the envelope of uh, the specs, the processing specs, um, try to get you know as many actions on screen at one time, right. kind of try to impress you in that way, um, while also building on the mechanics that have uh, made those series uh, so successful in the past. But like, you, like we've been saying, it's not really different. You know, it's just kind of like a, a refined. I, I I don't know. I don't. I kind of don't like the word refined. I mean, I guess it's kind of accurate, but to me, it sounds like that's saying better. And I don't think it's necessarily well. I mean, better overall because there there's something to be said for experiencing something like novelty, experiencing something new and different. And if you don't have that experience, then it's not going to be as enjoyable of a game, even if. The mechanics might be a little bit more refined. I think relative. I'm making sense. Or I think um, better is a relative term, mm-hmm. you know. And so, when I say refined, it's really just, I guess, streamlining mm-hmm. is the best way to put it. Really polished, maybe. Yeah, polished and streamlined. Polish up the mechanics on level three, <laughs> um, you know. And so, I think you're definitely right, and that seems to be the common element of pretty much every AAA game we've seen this year. Mm-hmm. I. I really can't oh, yeah. think of one that breaks that mold. Um, 
And I think, honestly, the indies were the big hits this year. Mm. You know, and like in almost all of the you know game of the year lists for whatever they're worth, the vast majority of them weren't triple A games. They were Kickstarter games yeah, and indie games, and you know, yeah, like the game of the year, and like according to a lot of people, was Inquisition, right? Um, Which I I haven't played it, so mm. I can't comment, but I can't really see that as being player of the game of the year. I mean. Yeah, I'm actually almost. I, I don't, I'm almost done with it myself. Um, I've really enjoyed it, um, and actually, I'm finding myself kind of wishing those a little bit longer. And this is probably because I'm one of those people that doesn't do all the side content. Um, I kind of wish that there was a little bit more to the main story, um, as well as still having all the side content. But even that, with that being said, um, I mean, I've enjoyed my time with it. I think it's a solid game, um, and the the appeal of kind of like the open worldness of it. Is kind of growing on me, even though it's not necessarily what attracted me to it. Fair enough. Um, so I mean, I, I think it's solid. I think that like of all the games that like were kind of that were AAA and kind of up for that sort of um, word because it is massive and it's very well produced. Um, I think that you know, it makes sense that that would be game of the year. Um, but yeah, when you get into like the indie scene, that's where you start to have more of the um, the innovation and that sort of stuff that we academics all like. <laughs> so I don't know. I to me, I mean, and again, I haven't played. Inquisition, but it just seemed like kind of like what you were saying, the perfect sort of choice for them, like kind of the safe choice mm-hmm. for Game of the Year for a lot of these magazines, sure. because it was a big name release, and it's this you know, RPG slash um, adventure type series um, with you know, current gen slash new gen whatever you want to refer to it as uh, graphics and processing, yeah, right, yeah. and um, it, it's, a lot of these magazines are not really, like Call of Duty still, and kind of has like a stigma you, we could, I could. I mean, I don't know if y'all agree with me, but I think there's a stigma against Call of oh, Duty. Of course. Yeah, in the, yeah I, agree. I mean, especially. So I've been I don't playing, think they could pick that. Uh, I, I'm not. A, I'm not even a fan of the series, and I and I noticed that. So. Yeah. And and when it comes to to Dragon Age, for me personally, um, I was seeing a lot of these magazines rave on it and talk about it like it was Game of the Year, and it hadn't even been released, or it was released like a couple of days ago. So that kind of got me thinking, hmm, I don't know about well, this. Well, you know, it's definitely like, got uh, the intellectual property hype attached to it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that's kind of what I was thinking, too, is that, you know, how much of it is this game is, like, awesome and how much is of it is it's got this hype behind it and there aren't really other options that we feel like we can safely publish as Game of the Year. I, I definitely right. think and it's still have people read us. You know, honestly, if we're looking to the AAA scene, you know, and... We see this across every genre. I mean, even Divinity Original Sin. I don't know if you guys played that one. But they were basically trying to modernize Planescape Torment. Yeah. Like, and it failed horribly. The game was so boring. Did, um, did it really fail? Because I've actually heard a lot of good well, things Well, it's because it. it's the first game of that genre that people have played in forever. So it got really hyped. But I played it myself, and I cannot imagine giving that game more than, you know, I don't do the number system, but like a 5 out of 10. Wow. Yeah, I've had um, a few friends who've actually really oh, been wow. into it. So, but again, it could just be that they were kind of hungry for that style of game. It's the first exactly. one that's been decent in a long right. time. Uh, yeah. Honestly, if I was to choose the most innovative game that sort of broke its own mold, I would choose Wolfenstein: The New mm-hmm. Order. Yeah, I, I can I can definitely see that. Out of the ones that I've played, um, I would agree with you. Wolfenstein: New Order, um, especially when you consider the the sort of like the roots of the series. Mm-hmm. And how it really was um, focused solely on the uh, the, the FPS, uh, the, the, the running around. Uh, really, not even the tradition, the what we consider the modern FPS, but the old style FPS of the run and gun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, running around, shooting, taking a lot of damage. Mm-hmm. None of this is really focused on any sort of um, real experience or any sort of like um, um, cinema or narrative. It's just an action game, an old style action game. And the new one, um, I would say, and I'm trying, I'm struggling to think of a, of a better example, but uh, I would say it's the the narrative that um, drew, like, really kind of had me going for the uh, entire game, um, even more so than the Telltale releases that I played. Yeah, absolutely. And I really enjoy the narrative. <coughs> I think the Telltale games still appeal to me personally because I really like the um, the choice. Um, and even though we know from experience, and like the more you play these Telltale style games, the more you can sort of see the formula in a way. And you can see that your choices usually don't matter. Mm-hmm. But just the, yeah. the very fact that you're able to sort of flavor your playthrough, like right. this is my spin on this character, mm-hmm. um, I think that that really kind of appeals to me. You know, honestly, that's the the first episode of the Game of Thrones. I guess that that qualifies as a 2014 series. It does. Yeah. You know, and. Um, 
I think they did their best in this episode, better than they have in any other game that I've played from them so far, to make you feel like your choices made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually replayed it um, completely, the first two episodes, in two different ways. And so I could tell that, no, your Mm -hmm. choices actually mean dog shit. Yeah, yeah. But... It, I was fooled mm-hmm. the first time through. Like, I immediately went back through and played it back to back, mm-hmm. which I've never done with one of their games before because it's, you know, almost all narrative. So it's mm-hmm. like, why would you just rewind the DVD and hit play again? Mm-hmm. But seriously, I was fooled. I thought that my choices were a huge matter. Mm-hmm. Actually, interestingly enough, um, you know, that one kind of might make you feel like. Um, make you feel like you make a difference, but I've actually found the Tales of the Borderlands, Tales from the Borderlands, um, the first episode, there was a key decision I made that doesn't ultimately change like what happens, but there's a very big detail that's very different between the two playthroughs that I did. Yeah. Um, and like I'm curious to see to what extent that actually matters later. Yeah. Um, because um, like I don't want to spoil anything, especially since you haven't played it yet. Sure. Um, but like you know whether or not a particular character shows up again later. Jim, have you played the Game of Thrones uh, episode? No, I haven't. I'm a little behind on those. Um, I actually I haven't even played season two of Walking Dead, and I actually own that. One. Oh wow. Yeah. Um. So uh, yeah, I'm a little bit behind. Of course, I played uh, Wolf Among Us. Right. Uh, yeah. We were with y'all. That one. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, speaking of uh, you know choice in games, I was kind of again going back to, to Wolfenstein: New Order. It really it did have uh, at least one choice in the game that did affect um, the rest of the playthrough, and that was that initial choice between um, whether whether you were going to let Fergus or Wyatt die. Right, mm-hmm. and that does kind of that does kind of change the future, and, and you do get um, in addition to having like a different uh, member in your uh, I don't want to say party because it's not really right. But they are is kind of like your your resistance movement. You have a different member, and they kind of give a different spin on everything. Um, they do have a different story to tell and that kind of thing. So it does give you incentive to replay it. But and also you have um, different ways to approach um, gameplay elements. Like I know um, in one you can um, I think it's pick locks. It's pick lock locks. Or pick locks are diffusing. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. that's that's right. So it kind of gives you kind of open up uh, open opens up. Uh, excuse me, different areas of the world um, for different playthroughs, mm-hmm. which I thought was um, actually a pretty cool way to handle it. I mean, it's really, technically, it's only one choice, but it does make a difference. Right. It was, it was one of those things where I, I simultaneously wish more games would do it while also finding it to be a little bit cheap in a way, because yeah. it's at the very beginning of the game, and they straight up tell you, you've unlocked the Fergus timeline. Right. Or you've unlocked the Wyatt timeline. It's, it's cheap. In the sense that, you know, as people who study narrative, we know that, you know, when you branch, when you create a branch, it just becomes exponential. Yes. So every branch you make, it gives developers migraines. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, doing it like that is also, like, the most effective, mm-hmm. you know. And you want to stay away from too much choice and too sure. much openness, yeah. or you'll end up with an Elder Scrolls game. And that, that's where I think that there's actually some yeah. good in that way, because it's kind of the idea of, like, you know, even when you're just writing a linear story, you kind of have this thing in your mind as an author of, like, okay... If this character does this, how might things go? And if the character does this, how might things go? And a lot of times, it's not really a huge difference. It's just like a few details are twisted around. Sure. Um, and so what this is kind of doing is saying, like, okay, we're going to, f- in a way, fully explore, or at least as fully as we think we need to, um, two alternatives. Okay. Um, and so you had, like, good, detailed, sort of like, you know, you had, like, two very good character arcs in each one, um, or, you know, one per. Um, and you had a lot of other no, it, twists. It, it was two. It was too because remember you also got a different yeah, you, uh, additional an, different character. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Jay or yeah. the Russian lady. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Jay is so much cooler. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, <laughs> Let me just throw that in there. Jay's great. So so you get you get new characters and you get like, you know, a, a twist on the content and stuff like that. So it's essentially the same game played two different ways based on a decision, which I think right. is very cool. For sure. Um, but at the same time I think there's just something to me like I guess I want more to be o- opaque. If that makes sense, you want. I, I want. Well, I, I want I the know, game to play out differently each time without me necessarily knowing exactly when and where and why. So, and sure. So, like way. the the minor nitpicks I remember that we had when we played the game were more of the um, the live decision making instead mm-hmm. of the you are presented with this, mm-hmm. make the choice. Like uh, when BJ walks into the room that his arm is tattooed in the mm-hmm. internment camp. You yeah, know? yeah. And you know, yeah. The, the, they don't punish you at all for not sitting down or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the the choice is yeah, like that. There were- 
Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that the game could have done with more of those if only, and I think we, we mentioned that um, in our write-up, even if the other alternative is they're going to kill you. Right, even so if the player just dies, really yeah, that's, that's fine. It's right. a stupid they choice, but it's a choice. Right. This right. Whole story line. It, it allows the player to rebel line. and subvert the system. Yeah, That would have been a really cool touch, and I think um, I'm kind of not really too sure why they didn't do it, because it seems like it'd be pretty easy to just have yeah. um, the enemy kill you and have a game over screen. Mm. It's not like they have to do any sort of long story or anything. I think that I can sort of answer that question in so much as just to say that those of us who aren't making it, coming at it fresh, could see that, like, oh, this is a place where we are just kind of railroaded and it would be very easy to have this alternative. When you're making it, you're probably just thinking, this is just, like, one of, like, the little quick things you're going to do on the way to the main level that we've designed. So Sure. It, it's, just, it's just, like, kind of a matter that, of perspective. That's also kind of a cop-out, I think. <laughs> I, yeah. I agree. I agree with Richard. I think it is a cop-out. Um, but at the same time... That, you know that's definitely one of the more positive titles that we've seen this mm-hmm. year in the sense that it took what was originally a shoot 'em up fire the dual wield machine guns mm-hmm. genre and completely flipped it mm-hmm. and made this really emotionally evocative really interesting gameplay mm-hmm. it incorporated choice the level design was fresh it had some really great cinematography elements to it mm-hmm. and so yeah oh definitely that was one and of the games that really did break the mold yeah yeah and and i do think um going back to what chris was saying about um you know that kind of like the alternate timeline of, of you know the white and fergus choice um and not necessarily liking it. I thought that for this sort of game, it fit the the theme of the game so well because the whole game, you were in an alternate timeline anyway. You were in this timeline where the Nazis had won. So giving you this additional, like, slight variation on that alternate timeline, uh, to me, I thought it made perfect sense and kind of, like, fit right in with what, what I might have been expecting. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, I mean, you know, I, I like I said, I kind of <laughs> have mixed feelings about it because... I like that they did it, and I like. Th- I think the more games ought to do this or something along those lines, instead of just having like just a straight up. Here is the one way that this could possibly go. Then, um, at the same time, I don't know. It yeah, just, it, it felt weird to me. So then, if the general theme of 2014 was kind of, I mean, I don't know if there's a, a clean word to you know bundle it up with, but kind of boring and um, streamlined yeah. and prescriptive really mm. a lot of these games even even a lot of the games I would have gone back and cited as kind of being my favorite or the best that I like in the ones I most enjoyed um, you know Mario Kart was a big deal um, I didn't love it but it was good you know mm-hmm. um, Super Smash Bros was awesome it was amazing but it was Super Smash Bros you know right. it's, it's a lot of very sort of safe reboots refinements um, you know stuff like that it's it's kind of an interesting parallel to the movie industry I, I forget exactly what the numbers were but I heard that there were like I think Interstellar was the only film in like the top ten for some period of time that wasn't a remake or a reboot or a sequel or anything like that. It was like the only thing that was original content to be in the top ten. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. So then what about um, something that is wholly new and original? Well, I mean, the mechanics were definitely borrowed, but I'm I'm thinking of Shadows of Mordor. Mm. You know, that was... um, I, I still got to play that game. I really do. Yeah, so sure. I hear so many good things about it. Uh, it was honestly one of my top games of the year. And um, even though it borrowed its mechanics pretty much directly from the Arkham series, mm-hmm. I think that's fine. You know, borrowing mechanics and you know being inspired by mechanics is great. Yeah. Perfectly fine. I think MMOs show us that really yeah, well. Yeah. Um, and yet they tried to... Uh, break the mold by saying you don't need this strong prescriptive narrative just to have fun Mm -hmm. and you know coming from the narrative guy that means a hell of a lot you know and so when i was playing this game i just i didn't do any missions half the time i just ran around slaying orcs i went and i ran into strongholds to gather the biggest crowd of them that i could Mm -hmm. and i um, skipped forward in time to use the nemesis system to like level up all of my nemeses, mm. and then I just got into the most one-sided fight that I possibly could, just to see if I could do it. Huh. You know, and I didn't do it for any goal; it was just to have fun. It was yeah. flow state. It was just pure, unadulterated flow state. That's what that game is. Nice. So, I um, I bought it on Steam, and I'm trying to sort of 
<clears throat> it's a little bit weird right now on my PC because I've got like a fairly large screen, and there's like the the way the camera angles and stuff are set up, you kind of need the whole screen for this thing. Right. And I sit relatively close, and I use my headphones all the time. So like I either need to unplug the headphones and sit back, or I just need to get used to being able to like move my head while I play. <laughs> but yeah, it's um th- my my initial impression of that game is uh pretty good. I'm trying to figure out how to make it run smoothly on my computer because I've I'm, I've figured out that I can't just turn it on ultra and play. <laughs> so. I don't think many people can. Right. Well, let me ask y'all um, a question about uh, a release that I've heard a lot about, but I actually haven't played. Um, have y'all played uh, at the new Alien game, Alien Isolation? I keep hearing about that. I haven't played it. And the reason why I bring it up was because um, we were talking about games that have sort of like pushed the envelope or, or sort of done some sort of uh, revolutionary thing. And what I keep hearing about it and uh, of this game is that um, it kind of uh, you know helps redefine like a new way for survival horror. It kind of like puts a new twist on the genre. Hmm. Um, and I haven't really. It's been a while since I played a survival horror game. To be honest, I think my last one was Resident Evil Four, and that was way back on the GameCube. Right. <laughs> but my, but uh, my last... from what I from what I understand, go ahead, Richard. I was just gonna say that my last survival horror game was. Um... Descent, or was it, no, not Descent, I'm thinking of the board game, uh, what's it, Amnesia, The Dark Descent, ah. yeah, that was my last one. Hmm. Is that is that considered a survival horror? I mean, out of curiosity, I suppose, I'm not, I, mean, I suppose not, but, I think it's just It's definitely horror, horror but <laughs> yeah. you don't really, do you really need to, like, is it really like you're constantly, your, your life is constantly being threatened? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you, of... if you look at shadows, you go insane, you know, that's... Um, I suppose that's true. I, I guess kind of the question that defines it, because I, any game that involves the threat of dying, it technically is a survival game. Yeah, but, you I know. Think, I think survival horror means, like, it's your a survivor, possibly, like, in either, either in a wilderness or, like, a post-apocalyptic setting where, like, you have to worry about food. And well, I would actually say that a survival stuff. horror game, uh, probably inappropriately, but the genre has made out survival horror to be a game in which you have guns mm. and, like, you're fighting to survive, mm. whereas... That doesn't really, but that doesn't really fit the description. No, yeah. but that's, that's a good point. That's not necessarily. I mean, I think I think it's sort of become that over time, somewhat. But I think um, Resident Evil Four, I guess, kind of had like a good mixture. But the earlier Resident Evil games, you really kind of couldn't shoot your way out of problems. You kind of you you had very limited ammo, and your guns were just sort of um, a way to get around an obstacle, and not necessarily a way to punch through. Right. It, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, at the later Resident Evils. Uh, starting with four, but I think four again. I think four struck the best balance. But um, later Resident Evils became a bit more actiony. Um, Alien Isolation um, is supposed to um, really kind of be that non-actiony um, type play. You really have you to know. kind of like develop your own weaponry. I, I don't want to say weaponry, but your own devices to kind of like um, find a way to avoid the xenomorph. Right. Because uh, you're not. You can't just. Shoot it. I think that uh, that actually might be. I think one of the reasons that Alien Isolation got so much praise, I didn't expect anything of it, especially after the colossal failure that was Colonial Marines. Mm-hmm. But I think oh, yeah. the reason that it took everybody by storm was because the whole point of it was to make you powerless. It makes mm-hmm. you vulnerable and you can't fight back. Mm-hmm. Whereas 99.9% of games out there that are all AAA games and whatnot, it's all about combat, hack and slash, shooting, yeah, yeah. magic, etc. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, what year did, did Outlast come out in early 2014 or is that a 2013 game? I'm not sure. Um, I'll, I'll, look, I'll look it up. But regardless, you know, I think the reason that these kind of games are so popular is because the player is weak. Yeah. Uh, Dark Souls, the player can die in like two hits, Mm -hmm. and the game isn't about you becoming this huge, awesome, powerful warrior. It's about you struggling through thousands of deaths. and like adversity. Exactly. And so I think that might be a lot of why some of these, you know, less AAA, I guess, you know, less mainstream, I guess, games mm-hmm. um, became so popular and got such sudden critical appraise was because 
they're breaking the mold in the sense that you're they're not they're not empowering the player. Yeah. That's an interesting well, thought I, because I always kind of thought that you know a lot of those games, especially Dark Souls, kind of being like a massacre sort of style of game. Sure. It was just because people were wanting a challenge, they're wanting something that wasn't like holding your hand, etc. But the psychological angle of it being about overcoming adversity and that sort of thing um, was something that I didn't really consider. I guess because. Most of the sort of voices of gaming that you hear don't really think that way. They right. Don't seem to. <laughs> I don't think that Dark Souls was really. I mean, I, of course it is a Massacre game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, you know, I, for me, the ideal version of those is things like Super Meat Boy, You Want to Be the Man, mm-hmm. VVV, etc. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think Dark Souls really fits that mold. It, it approaches it, but maybe because not quite it's there, yeah. Dark Souls isn't about learning through dying or dying on like the game wants you to die right here you're gonna die right here Mm. dark souls is just you're really weak and even like the random enemies you encounter can kill you in a couple hits Mm -hmm. whereas most rpgs or hack and slashes you power up and you level up to the point where you just like mow people down and dark souls is all about making you feel like these are real threats Mm -hmm. around you Mm -hmm. so cool yeah, I I still um, I guess that's why I don't like Dark Souls. I don't know. I don't. I I think it's kind of odd because I actually do enjoy playing um, challenging older style games, especially. But I do enjoy playing challenging games. But uh, with Dark Souls, I don't know if it's just um, the way that the pacing is kind of start stop um, that does it, to it for me, or if it's just that I because I, I know that people you know I I'll come out and I'll say oh I think it's kind of unfair. Uh, the way that they present the challenges. Yeah. And then other people will say, well, no, uh, you just kind of have to be more careful and blah, 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 et cetera. So it's kind of a... I don't know exactly where the argument lies because I haven't played enough. I've played um, many hours in the first one and I just couldn't get into it for that reason. Right. Well, that, um, that's... But, uh, but yeah, I, I understand that argument of, well, you can just you know play it slowly, but I just feel that if you're going to go for this, um, this is an action game. I have, you know, in this fantasy setting... I have all this weapon, armor, equipment, I'm battling these fantasy creatures, and I constantly have this start-stop of now I have to be really slow, really careful, look out for a trap everywhere, you know, examine my surroundings very carefully, and now I have to be in this battle, in this pitch battle. It's something about that, like, you know, difference in pacing and constantly shifting between those two mentalities. Um, It really kind of, I don't know, disturbs me. I just really don't like it. Well, so I think that um, uh, an interesting thing about that is that people I think what people really like is the style and the concept of the game and that's why Dark Souls Dark Souls really became a part of gamer culture for a while there Mm -hmm. it was really like our big lens Um, and its predecessors were never really that you know it didn't live up to that kind of standard and I don't think Dark Souls 2 did either and I think that um, the gameplay itself you know, having played all of them myself, it's clunky. Mm. People describe yeah. that dodge roll and whatnot as being clunky, and some people have come mm-hmm. out as saying, well, it's it's just, you know, intended to be difficult, and mm. they do it that way so that it's hard, you know. Yeah. No, it's just clunky. The, <laughs> the gameplay is clunky. Yeah. Um, and the reason the game survives and becomes so hyped and is so critically praised is because of the style and the tone of it and the the concept that you have to persevere through death and sometimes even use death to learn your surroundings, you know, so stuff like that. Um, But I think the core of the gameplay, Jim, you're absolutely right. I think it's honestly piss poor. Hmm. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's us. There's plenty of people that, that really do enjoy it quite a bit, it seems. And I think, I think you did touch on something um, that is, that is the concept and also the, um, uh, the atmosphere. I've heard a lot of people, rave about how rich the uh, the lore is in the game and how much you can sort of explore and learn on your own sort of environmental that is not, narrative mm-hmm. right environmental narrative that is not it's not fed to you in the game itself you kind of have to go seeking for it and right. um, i think that does appeal to, and that appeals to me too to be quite honest if, if the game didn't have the other flaws um, i'd probably be a huge fan and you know that's honestly um revisiting some of the issues that i have with the majority of games in 2014 is you know, besides um, the Dark Dark Souls Two came out in early like February, right, or something like that. You might be right. Yeah, yeah. It, it came out. It came out early this year. Yes. Yeah, but I'm not sure. You if know, it's February, the yeah. vast majority of these games, especially games like Assassin's Creed and whatnot, 
it's all very prescriptive narrative. And the Telltale games, I mean, as much as I love them, they are adventure narrative games. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so I think we haven't seen many of these more subtle. You know, going back to what I said before about like the Elder Scrolls games, while those definitely do have a more prescriptive narrative than Dark Souls, mm-hmm. the we are sort of lacking the exploration and the learn through doing and the um, you know sort of tertiary narratives of some of these games. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I maybe it's part of that um, streamlining process because perhaps they're, um, I hate to say it like this, but maybe they're, from a uh, producer standpoint, they're thinking we're going to cut the fat and they don't really, they don't want to go back and add all those extra elements that do sort of flesh the world out because they, they're just trying to get the game out as quickly as possible. Yeah. I think there's, I think personally that this year, one of the problems with a lot of these games and why, why they feel so bland um, is because of that lack of that extra um, that extra depth uh, behind, you know, like the the content behind uh, the the like the sh- shallow surface that we're <clears throat> shown right. and given. Um, and the reason why that's not there is because all these games are trying to capitalize on um, these new consoles that have recently come out, and they're st- and still starved for games. And so they're they're trying to get out content, and they know that people are going to buy it. That's one of the you know, like Destiny is a great, in my opinion, a great example of this. Um, it was specifically made to show off the, the you know processing capabilities of this new generation. That's what it's for, and so you buy it as like this sort of showpiece, um, and all it really needed to do was be a refined FPS. That's all it kind of had to do in order to. Um, satisfy the market. It didn't have to be anything extra. Yeah. Because that's not really what people and needed. If, they just needed a showpiece. And if I had a PS4, I probably would have bought it, you know? so Exactly. I guess and that's and what else would you get? I mean, there's not a whole lot of options, so that's why they want to get these games out. They're, they don't have the time to go back and add that extra uh, depth you know, to it. I Hopefully, wonder, we'll get that. I wonder if you compared the, the theme of 2014 to, like, the year that the previous console generations have come out, if you would see a similar sort of streamlining, cutting the fat sort of process. I bet you would. I yeah. bet you yeah. would. Because um, I remember there were a lot of <clears throat> games that were <clears throat> early generation, you know, like Xbox 360, PS3, all that, that mm-hmm. um, were hyped but didn't turn out to be very good. They weren't, you know, kind of the classics. And it wasn't until you got... I mean, you have a few exceptions, of course, obviously, but it wasn't until, like, you know, maybe a year or two in that you started to have, like, the classics that kind of stuck around. You know what? Yeah, and it was the around the middle of the life of a console that you got the real classics, mm-hmm. and then the end of the life of a console when you get the experimental ones. Shadow of the Colossus came out, like, the month before the PS3 release, didn't it? Um, yeah. It, it was way at the tail end of the PS2 life cycle. I know that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I say life cycle. I mean before the new consoles came out. Yeah, I mean, that's life cycle. Yeah, yeah basically. I mean, like, yeah. they survived a little while longer, but... Right. No, it survived quite a while yeah. longer. Yeah, that's, why I, that's I, a I good point, you know. I, and, of course, this is common knowledge that when the console comes out, the first launch titles are pretty crap. Mm-hmm. But people don't expect... Assassin's Creed to be crap and Call of Duty to be crap, mm-hmm. you know, in, in a general sense, looking sure, objectively, sure. Yeah. whether or not, what, what, whatever you feel about the series. I hate Assassin's Creed personally, mm-hmm. but people don't. Ex- I'm with you on that. <laughs> What's that? I said I, I'm actually with you on that. Yeah, I, I ever since Revelation. Really <laughs> God, don't even get me started. Yeah. Um, but so people don't expect these IPs to be so generic and the studios that make them to produce such a streamlined generic product but there's nobody else really Mm -hmm. back then in the days of the other consoles when they came out you had all of these other studios that were making these big games but now six years down the line when the new consoles come out the only companies producing these triple a titles are the big corporations that have survived it's it's interesting because i I, i've kind of been like bouncing this idea around in my head as we've been talking that it's been a very long while since we've had like really crafted games if that makes sense no yeah we we have a lot of iterative Mm -hmm. games we have and like you know not to say that like series and franchises are inherently bad i think there are a lot of really great oh no of course not. but it's like i'm trying to think of any games recently that like i've really thought were just like really well crafted and deep and detailed and like you know you have a lot of like good you know content to go along with like your innovative gameplay or whatever but i think a lot of times people are kind of 
designing games based on like the back of the box bullet points or they're basing it on like what you can say to get people to clap at E3 that sort of thing yeah um, and <clears throat> that's well it's good for sales it's not necessarily good for kind of having like these good lasting sort of titles that you're going to keep in your library forever you know right you know, but why do they why do they want you to keep it in the library forever if there's only a few game? Co- I'm sorry to be cynical here. Oh no, no, I'm, 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 right, only, I'm right there with you. If, yeah. if there's only a few companies around, when you're right, there's only a few of those big giant companies around making those AAA games. So why do they want you to keep one of their games in your library right. for a long time? Because I mean, they want you to buy their next game. You yeah. look at that kind of stuff, and you know, I think that's actually a really good point that we've kind of stumbled onto is mm-hmm. that you know a lot of these studios like id is id even around anymore they are yeah I mean, yeah oh yeah what are they making um i well, don't they know make, what they're currently they, working they make on. engines they, they well they do make game engines um specifically that other comp that they sort of like sell the rights off to they're, like, they're like part Unreal of does as well they're part of zenimax now um so like you know yeah. i don't know how much of they made they rage recently but then like whereas Years and years ago, you know, like back in the PS2 and early PS3 days, you had companies like Mythic and Ensemble and stuff like that that were these mid size double A, I guess, companies that made these games for the main consoles. Mm-hmm. Now, those mm-hmm. types of companies, the mid size double A companies, they're making social games mm-hmm. and educational games and not triple A big console mm-hmm. games. And now that you mentioned it, I think, um, and like they'll sometimes be like mid-sized companies too, they'll do contract work with AAA studios. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, now that you mention it, like um, I'm trying to think of like, you know, good sort of second party games, so to speak, that, um, you know, aren't the first party, like, you know, Nintendo, but like might be owned right. by. The um, ones that, I've, that come to mind for me are Bastion and their <laughs> new one, Transistor, mm-hmm. you know, which Transistor was all right. But, mm-hmm. you know, those companies of that scale mm-hmm. They don't really exist anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm trying. I don't know how big Intelligent Systems is, but like then you're starting to get into the Japanese market, which is right. totally different. So N- Nintendo also owns them completely. Yeah, that, that's so what, they're kind of yeah. They're just a subsidiary. They're not their own company. Exactly. That and uh, Retro Studios is another good. Same example. thing yeah. with um, Idos, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and um, no, Idos is the one that made the Hitman series, right? I think you're right. Yeah, I think I think yeah. so. Idos used to be. They're pretty big, aren't they? Right, but now they're owned by Square Enix. Yeah. Uh, speaking oh, of which, Square Enix let go of the uh, Tomb Raider IP. Yep, they did. So that's interesting. So oh, that's yeah. that's a really big thing. Is now the the big names: Square, Nintendo, mm-hmm. Sony, EA, Activision, Microsoft. Yeah. These are the only companies making AAA games. That's really weird. I had never thought about that before. And I think it's it's kind of like you know we're I think a lot of us now kind of ignore the mobile market. We're kind of aware that it's there. Well, of course, but, but it's I think it's kind of like we're starting to see now the real effects that people are predicting in the mobile market. That you're either going to have like super big games or you're going to have like li- really tiny. Right. Tiny you'll games, either have you know? tiny tiny games or you'll have. Uh, the big games that come in different versions. You've got the Hearthstones mm-hmm. that are all about replayability. It's not a prescriptive... It's not an experience. Hearthstone mm-hmm. really isn't an experience. It's a card game. It's just, it's yeah. straight up a card game. Replayable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you have um, Infinity Blade. Mm-hmm. You know, And Infinity Blade is all about the gameplay. Mm-hmm. It's all about the simulation. Mm-hmm. You know, And then you have games... Uh, like the room, mm-hmm. and so that use interesting mechanics to get across an interesting experience. Um, but we really haven't seen any exclusively mobile games that have shaken us up this year. Really, yeah, yeah. it's other games that have been ported to uh, mobile, like mm-hmm. Papers Please mm-hmm. got ported to mobile. That was a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then it got censored. Oh, yeah. so it got censored by Apple. Yeah, and then it got uncensored, and then it was right. That, of course, it was a mess. <laughs> but so did, did we. We talked about that, didn't we? The did censorship you? issue. I, think with, we, uh, I was asking Chris. I thought I'm not sure if we did or not. I know I, I I mentioned wanting to at some point, but yeah, I don't know if we ever mentioned it on the podcast. Maybe briefly, but I I, I still think that that's so ironic that <laughs> they censored Papers Please. But <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah, I don't, thanks Apple. I don't know. I don't know what intern made that call. Yeah. But. <laughs> that was, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but yeah. So I think that. I think we can sort of sum up 2014 as being a year of games made by big corporations for the new consoles that are all streamlined and aimed to cut the fat. Mm. Yeah. 
It was some really good I, moments I, in there, I, too. Of course. Yeah. Streamlining yeah. doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. Sure. Yeah. From what I've heard and from what I've seen on Twitch trends, mm-hmm. the new Call of Duty is amazing. And uh, from what people are saying about the new Dragon Age, it's phenomenal. It mm-hmm. definitely makes up for the terrible Dragon Age 2, yeah, yeah. which I really need to play Inquisition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have Shadows of Mordor, which mm-hmm. was just a fighting game that completely copy-pasted the fighting system from Arkham and put the Lord of the Rings skin on it. Mm -hmm. But it was awesome because it was just pure flow theory. It's like pure adrenaline, you know? Um, It doesn't mean these games are all bad, Mm -hmm. but we really are lacking in the innovation Mm -hmm. department. Yeah, and I think what we were talking about, too, or um, what's interesting about that, too, is those are the games that actually were released 2014. I think the other stories of 2014, um, like we're all really excited about these things, looking like they might be cutting or breaking the mold. Like you know, No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky, for example. Yeah. That's all stuff that we've sort of been following that's been a big deal this year, but obviously they're not the games that are out this year. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So the new Zelda is another one with this like open world. Yeah, um, yeah, very explore, true. Explore any dungeon that you want in any order, like the original. Mm-hmm. So that's actually uh, um, that, that's great a great concept. That's a good segue actually into kind of like uh, something we might be able to close with here in a bit. Is um, what are you guys looking forward to in 2015? Yeah, I think um, I guess I think we've kind of returned to the point that this is a very cyclical thing mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it's the same thing that happened with all the other console generations, that the first round is just very chaffy. Mm-hmm. And near the end of 2014, we started seeing the AAA titles that mattered come mm-hmm. out, like Dragon Age. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now we're going to start seeing some of the ideas that began in 2013, 2014 start to come to fruition, like No Man's Sky, uh, The Witcher 3, mm-hmm. the new Zelda game. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 5. Metal Gear Solid 5. You know, and mm-hmm. this is another example of games that come out in a series that doesn't mean they're bad, just mm-hmm. because it's an, a continuation mm-hmm. or an iteration. You know, um, I mean, it's very natural even to um, sort of like get hooked on a character's or to a world or something like that and want to keep revisiting it. Um, I was even thinking as I'm drawing to near the end of uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, as cool as the game has been, I'm kind of thinking, like, I'm wanting it to be like a tabletop <coughs> RPG campaign where it can keep going indefinitely. Right. And it's like, well, I'm looking forward to the next game that's going to, especially when this is important, something about Bioware that I really like that they do decently well is carry your decisions into the next game. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that I'm kind of looking forward to in, you know, Inquisition 2, whatever that might be. So... With the focus on iterative games mm-hmm. and games that we can pump out a lot of copies of, mm-hmm. I actually do kind of hope that that continues, as weird as that sounds, mm-hmm. but I hope that they learn something through this process mm-hmm. and just do it better. Yeah. You know, like, um, I've been really hyped on this MMO that was announced near the tail end of 2014 called Revival. And it's this game that uh, it's made by the guys who are doing the FPS module for uh, Star Citizen. Hmm. And this MMO is all about tabletop storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's an MMO in which all of the content that is like progression content is run by game masters that the studio has a writing team and they develop D&D modules and run them in the game. And it's this constantly evolving world. Mm -hmm. It's just, that's it. That's the whole thing is you, you're either there and you experience the story of this MMO and you're, you experience the in game events Mm -hmm. or you miss it and you log on and see how the world has changed. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So I would love to see that sort of continuation, that sort of, you know, develop a world and then create games that are stories of that world mm-hmm. and see that continue, which essentially that's what Assassin's Creed yeah. is. Yeah. But I think that they have gotten far too into the whole, let's just pump out the next one. Yeah. You know? It, yeah. It, there was a time when it was basically an annual release. Right. The, like, uh, Assassin's Creed 2 and then, like, the 2 trilogy, if you will, that was every year. There's sure. Assassin's and Creed. that's fine. But lately it's been, like, twice a year, oh, which yeah. is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, especially, like, because they do, like, two different games, like, on different timelines. Kind right. Of, yeah. it, it's honestly getting kind of ridiculous. <laughs> um, like, Revelations, when that one started the chaff of Assassin's Creed, mm-hmm. and they started filling it with all this horrible little extra stuff, like um, tower defenses yeah. and just... <laughs> Just bullshit. <laughs> well, what's funny about that is in Revelations, like, when I played through it, because I just want to see the story before 3 came out, um, I actually avoided the tower defense entirely just because I got so used to in um, 
Uh, what was the one before it? I'm drawing a blank on the name. Brotherhood. Brotherhood, yeah. And Brotherhood, they have the notoriety system. Right. And I was just so used to keeping my notoriety low that I never had to worry about tower defense. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I dodged a bullet there. Right. But so I think that um, this system of let's just pump out the next title in the series mm-hmm. As a concept, that's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be this Mass Effect, Dragon Age style. We're going to release in a trilogy one game every like two and a half to three years. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. You can pump out a title a year. You can pump out a title a month if you're Telltale. Mm-hmm. But do it right. Yeah, yeah. Get, do the series justice, and mm-hmm. that's what I want to see in 2015. I want to see. And well, and I think we will because it's just the way that like console life cycles work. But I want to see an end to the chaff. I want to get back to making real solid gaming experiences, mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of inevitable. Otherwise, people will just stop fucking buying it. Yeah, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, kind of building off of what what you're saying, um, I I kind of I want to see the same thing, but I also I also am a strong believer in. Um, taking a world, building another game in a similar style, but also <clears throat> it adding 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 innovations, adding twists, doing something different, building upon the the foundation that you have to make something new. And I think that's that's one of the reasons why I still um, am a Nintendo fan and have been for a while is that I do feel that uh, they try to do that with at least their um, marquee series, uh, in particular Super Mario and Legend of Zelda. Um, even though some may have fallen short of that uh, goal, the the general goal, despite the fact that these series have been around for uh, what thirty years now, yeah, thirty years, um, they are able to add enough to them that if you were to say play um, Super Mario Galaxy Two or Three D World and then go back and play uh, Super Mario One, you're going to get a very different experience, even though they're in the mm-hmm. same world and they have the same characters. Right. So I, I'm hoping for for that from more um, for more developers. You know, if they want to, if they feel that they have a world that they can explore and they can continue exploring with a new with a new game release, that's fine. Do that, but give me something new. Give me a new way to explore it. Not not completely new. I'm not saying throw you know throw everything out. Right. But, you don't want to but, change up all the gamer verbs, but mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, and, and and Super Mario Galaxy has the same gamer verbs as Super Mario Bros. One. Really. I mean, it's. There's there's some expansion. That's there, a good but. point. You know, it's Galaxy and Galaxy Two and whatnot. It's still just jump, squash. You know, yeah. run in circle. You know, use <laughs> mm-hmm. the stick, move left, right. Except it's a new perspective. Mm-hmm. That's a really interesting way to think about it. So yeah, um, that's what I would like to see in 2015, Chris. Um, I, I think I've kind of touched on. I'm kind of in agreement with you guys for the most part as far as the general <laughs> stuff. Um, like you know, games in particular that I'm looking forward to, MGS Five. Um, one that I already mentioned. Um, the new Zelda is going to be pretty awesome. Um, kind of a sleeper that I forgot about for a while that I'm really looking forward to now is uh, Persona 5. It's apparently oh. due sometime in 2015. Good one. Um, and I just finished playing through uh, 4 for the first time over the break um, and really loved it. And um, I'm curious to see what they do with the next one there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just in general, I think that, like you said, Richard, um, I, I, I can kind of see that you know the industry is kind of moving toward this thing and it's it's an old story we've been talking about this for years in game studies how you know the industry has to work this particular way because that's how you make the money and that sort of stuff Mm -hmm. um but at the same time you know you kind of accept that things are going to work a certain way and then hope they can kind of just refine it and make it better um so we're not asking for like huge crazy shifts in you know the paradigm um we can leave that to the indies and to the smaller studios um, and I think that they're doing a great job. Indie is becoming bigger and bigger, and I hope that continues. Um, as far as AAA goes, just kind of keep refining, um, and to whatever extent you can, keep trying to innovate and trying to um, put a new twist on things. Yeah, and I think that we're seeing a lot of that from, um, I mean, I suppose to generalize the East. You know, like Final Fantasy Fifteen is mm-hmm. coming out, Kingdom Hearts Three. Mm-hmm. You know, we're seeing a lot of these games that are. Um, while they may not be reinventing the wheel, they are doing what Jim said. They're changing the perspective and the way you approach mm-hmm. existing canon. Final Fantasy XV, you know, they are essentially making the combat style Kingdom Hearts, mm-hmm. and they're saying, okay, 
we're going to keep the same Final Fantasy world building, mm-hmm. narrative, etc., but we are going to change the way that you interface with it. Mm-hmm. And that's a really big innovation. Uh, yeah. Actually, that reminds me, too. I think Type-0 is due to come out this year. It is. Um, in the next couple, couple months. North America, so yeah. I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that nicely wraps up our thoughts on 2014 and 2015. You know, uh, a new version of a story that we've seen (laughs) multiple times over with the generations of consoles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, possibly a bit of a grim look at how uh, there are very few game companies nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all owned by another larger game company. And uh, there's not many people making them, really. Mm -hmm. It's all about the indies. Yeah. So... But we hope that 2015 sees some more innovative and mold-breaking titles, and uh, we hope that the continuations of our favorite series do it right. No more Assassin's Creed Unities. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for joining us on the 20th podcast. Uh, I'm Richard. I'm Chris. And I'm Jeff. And uh, thanks for watching, or listening, or joining, or <laughs> bye. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us what you thought of gaming in 2014, and what you're looking forward to. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. just expelled a demon. <laughs> Something like that. We're going. This is live. Yeah. Yeah, clearly.